Today we're going to talk about Chapter 6, Primary Mixed Dentition, and then we're also going to talk um, about Chapter 7, which is Periodontal Anatomy, although most of it should by now be review for you because you've had it probably in 101, and we've talked about some of it before um, already too, so it should be review on that one. But Primary Mixed Dentition, Chapter 6. So um, Primary Dentition, the universal numbering system uses letters for the primary dentition. So just like the permanent, it starts in the upper right and it goes around starting with A through J and then it drops down to the lower left and comes back from K to T. The primary dentition has 20 teeth, uh, 10 maxillary, 10 mandibular. You have incisors, you have um, primary central incisors, primary lateral incisors. You have primary canines, and then you don't have any premolars. You just have primary molars. The primary molars are replaced by your permanent premolars. So succedaneous teeth are teeth that replace another tooth. So your premolars are succedaneous. You don't have them in a primary dentition, but they replace the primary molars. Your permanent molars are non succedaneous. In other words, they do not have to have another tooth fall out in order for them to erupt. The primary dentition functions for chewing or mastication, supports your lips and cheeks, it forms your speech, and it maintains your arch space for your secondary teeth. They, your primary teeth erupt from about six to eight months of age to anywhere between two and three years of age. Um, during the six to two years of age is when most of the teeth, six months to two years is when most of the teeth erupt. And at the end of eruption, there should be 20 primary teeth. The primary teeth remain in place from about two years to about six years of age. Now keep in mind there are variations with all of these dates and stuff. Um, you often hear people say, you know, their, chi their child got a tooth at six months of age or three months of age or didn't get a tooth till they were a year. So there's variations in there. Um, most of the time though, what you'd be looking for is the eruption pattern. Do they erupt in the same order as they should? Meaning the mandibular central incisors come first, um, then the mandibular laterals are usually next or the maxillary centrals um, and then the maxillary laterals. So you've got your eight prime uh, permanent, eight primary teeth come in first, um, incisors. So we're looking more at eruption patterns. Um, after um, the period of the first tooth being lost or the first permanent tooth coming in, we call that mixed dentition. So mixed dentition is when they have primary and permanent teeth present. So keeping in mind that the first molars, teeth numbers 3, 19, um, 3, 14, 19, and 30, come in before a child loses any teeth or may come in before a child loses any teeth. Those are their first Professor permanent Franklin. molars. Franklin. Yes? Um, Emily's trying to get into the meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, let me get back. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this one. Okay, so um, a child may start to erupt their permanent first molars before they've lost a tooth. If the permanent first molars start to come in, that's called mixed dentition then, because now they have some permanent and some primary teeth. Um, the uh, mixed dentition phase lasts till they're about 12 years old, at which point, um, they should have lost all their primary teeth and should be having all their permanent teeth erupt. As soon as they lose the last primary tooth, then they are considered an adult dentition. Even though they technically haven't gotten all their teeth because third molars haven't come in yet. Primary crowns begin to form at six months in utero. So the primary crowns are starting to form before a baby is born. The crowns are complete about 10 months after they begin. 
the root formation takes place during the eruption process and emergence. So as the, the child is about six months old and starting to get their teeth, the, the roots are starting to form and are still in the process of forming. And the roots are complete at one and a half to three years after emergence. So in other words, after the tooth erupts or comes into the baby's mouth, um, it still takes another one and a half to three years for the root to be completely formed. And then exfoliation and replacement. So exfoliation is a term we use when a child's losing their teeth. Um, exfoliation and replacement, replacement being when the permanent tooth starts coming in, occurs between 6 and 12 years of age. So permanent crowns, permanent crowns begin to form and calcify beginning at birth for the first molars through 8 to 10 years for beginning third molars. So the permanent crowns, the crowns begin to form and, and form before the roots form on a tooth. And then the roots resorb first and the crown falls out on a baby tooth. Hopefully not on a permanent tooth. Um, the crowns complete their cal calcification about three to four plus years prior to eruption. And then the roots complete about three years after they erupt. So the crowns are forming, the crowns emerge, then the roots continue to form. Just like on the primary teeth. They just take a little bit longer, as you've noticed, three to four years um, prior to eruption and then three years after emergence on the roots. So if you look at a panoramic x-ray, which I don't know if you've done this yet in Professor Bowles' class, but if you haven't, you will. If you look at a, per a panoramic x-ray of, ch of children at various ages, um, you will see the teeth in different stages. And so um, at some point you'll see the, the just the crowns of the primary teeth if you were to see a pano on a baby. Um, if you were to see a pano on say a five or six year old, you would see some permanent crowns, you would see primary teeth, you may even see the eruption of the first molars. So it's kind of interesting looking. And I know you'll look at those in radiography. So the order of emergence or emergence being when they come into your mouth. So the order of emergence of primary teeth between six months and two years is the mandibular central incisors. So they get those two little tiny teeth on the bottom first. And then you get the other incisors. So sometimes the, um, the maxillary incisors will come in next, sometimes the mandibular lateral incisors, but the maxillary lateral incisors are the last of the incisors to come in. Then you've got the next teeth to come in are the first molars. So notice we skip the canines and we go to the first molars. Oftentimes they catch parents off guard because they see these little front teeth and they think the canines should come next, so they're not really looking in the back. But that's about the time the baby's really sticking their fingers back in the back of their mouth and biting on their thumb and stuff like that. That's when the first molars are starting to come in. Then the canines come in. And then finally come the second molars at about two years of age. And this is a picture of the baby teeth. This is always one of my favorite pictures. So you can see that the two little incisors come in first down here. Um, this baby's got a lot of their um, primary teeth in this one. And then this is a two year old that has all of their primary teeth in. Now, if you notice, just a, a note, is the primary teeth on the bottom are shaped just like, pretty much just like the permanents. You've got, your, your centrals are small, your laterals are slightly larger. This is what um, a three-year-old would look like if you took a pano, approximately. Um, you can see that they've got crowns forming all over the place down here. This row is their primary teeth. This is what you see in their mouth. They've got all their primary teeth, all 20 of them, but you can see all the crowns that are forming up above and down below. These right here are their permanent molars. 
You can see they're going to erupt right there behind the primary dentition. Same thing with the top. You can see they're going to erupt behind the primary dentition. They do not have roots on them yet. These are occlusal images on a primary dentition. You will be taking these in clinic sometime during term five or term six. You will have to bring children in or we'll have children scheduled. Lucky for you guys, um, term five will be during the month of February, or I should say the month of February will be during term five. And so with that being the case, you will um, February's Children's Dental Health Month, so we'll probably have a lot of children coming in and you'll get a lot of experience with taking occlusals and bite wings. But you can see how here's the per primary dentition and then these are the permanent teeth. And look at how large they look compared to that, those little primary teeth. Same thing here, these are the primary teeth right here and this is the permanent dentition down here. And as the permanent teeth are coming up. See how they're resorbing or breaking down the roots on the primary teeth? That's why um, when a tooth falls out, a primary tooth falls out, it doesn't have a root on it. So um, the order of emergence of the permanent teeth is between six years and the late teens or early 20s being the wisdom teeth. Um, the permanent teeth emerge in pretty much the same order. First come, uh, well, after the first molars come in the central incisors, mandibular central incisors, then all the other incisors. So some children will lose the lateral incisors on the mandibular arch first. Others will get their um, maxillary centrals, but by the time it's all said and done, their incisors should all be in by the time they're between seven and nine years old. Now there's gonna be variations in the age. Like I said, there's some five-year-olds that have them, and then you'll see some 10 year olds that are still getting their maxillary lateral incisors. So it varies. But as long as they're getting them in the same order as they should, that's OK then. So then the next thing that comes in once they've got all their incisors, all eight of their incisors are the premolars. So the premolars. Um, cause the primary molars to exfoliate and the premolars take their place. So the first molars, primary first molars will fall out and the first premolars will come in. And that happens usually about nine or 10 years old, along with the mandibular canines. They all come in about the same time. So all of a sudden the child loses like six teeth at once. And so then those teeth will come in and then there's like another little break in the action. And then about 11 or 12 years old, the second primary molars or their two year molars come out their second premolars come in, and that's about the same time that they're getting their permanent second molars. So there's a lot of action going on there. It's also about the same time that the maxillary canines fall out. So all of a sudden, around 11 or 12 years old, all the rest of the primary teeth fall out, plus they get four second molars. For purposes of testing, for purposes of clinic, and for boards, you will need to know when these teeth both primary and permanent erupt, and well, of course the permanents don't exfoliate, but when they um, erupt and when the primary teeth are exfoliated. So I've got some nifty little charts. There's charts in the book. Um, it's basically memorizing. And it's not that hard because when the primary tooth exfoliates is about the time the permanent tooth is coming in because they follow each other. This is a panoramic X-ray of a nine year old. So you'll notice on a nine year old, they've already got their permanent incisors, all eight of them. Four on the top, four on the bottom. You can see that their mandibular canines and premolars, first premolars are about to come in. You can see if you look up here on the maxillary, the maxillary canines are still up pretty high because they're not gonna come in until they're about 11 or 12, but the mandibular canines come in about nine. So see, they're coming up all the way. And then the maxillary first premolars are getting ready to come in as well. So you've got four premolars plus these two canines that come in at about nine years old. You can see by now the first molar, permanent first molar, has its roots pretty much. 
on all four of them. And you can see the crowns and part of the roots are already forming on the second. So see how on these teeth, these um, permanent canines, the roots not fully formed yet. You can see how it's still open. So this is a picture of a bite wing on an eight year old. And you can see that they have some primary teeth still in there. They've got a permanent first molar behind the primary teeth. And then here's your premolars getting ready to come in and your canine. That's an eight year old. So probably by the time this child is nine, these two will have fallen out and these two will have come in. This one will still be there. And then this, of course, is a permanent tooth. So um, primary teeth, as far as their morphology, they have um, primary teeth have relatively long roots compared to their crowns. So remember how like the um, permanent incisors, we said the crown and the roots were close to the same length. Not quite, but close. The primary teeth are not like that. You can see here the primary roots are a lot longer than the length of the crown. And then they're smaller than the permanent tooth of the same name. So in other words, the maxillary central incisors primary are smaller than the maxillary central incisor permanent. And that just makes sense. Child's head has to grow. And so here is a picture of a mixed dentition arch. And you can see this is a permanent first molar. This is a primary first molar. Same name tooth, totally different looks, totally different sizes. So um, there isn't a lot to learn on the morphology of primary teeth. We don't learn all the grooves and all that kind of stuff. We do have some distinguishing traits that help us to be able to tell them from the permanence. Um, that's probably the main thing you're going to ever need to know on the primary teeth. When they exfoliate, when the permanent ones erupt, um, and the difference in the looks between a primary and a permanent tooth. So when you have a child that's 10 and you're charting, you're restorative charting, you need to be able to know which of their teeth are primary and which of their teeth are permanent because they are in mixed dentition at 10 years old. So um, your primary teeth have large cervical crown bulges. They're very kind of unique shaped. When I say surgical crown bulges, look how narrow the occlusal surface right here is compared to how much it bulges out. Our permanent teeth don't do that. And they have relatively long roots compared to their crowns. They have thinner enamel and dentin layers. They're wider and they have fewer anomalies. So what that means is that thinner enamel and dentin layers, they have bigger pulp chambers. So when a child gets a cavity, it gets to the pulp a lot faster than when an adult gets a cavity. And when a cavity gets to the pulp, does anybody know what happens? What's inside the pulp? Yeah. Yep. There's blood and nerve supply in the pulp of the tooth. And so if a child gets a cavity and it travels to the pulp really quickly, they're going to get a toothache a lot faster than an adult getting a toothache. Because of their thinner enamel and dentin, bigger pulps. Their teeth are wider. You'll notice whenever you look at a child and they smile, they have pretty beautiful bright white teeth. Um, their permanent teeth, when they start to come in, have more of a tint of either gray or yellow. And they could, they're still pretty white, but they are they have a tint to them. They look more like this bottom picture. Um, they also have fewer anomalies, meaning they they follow more of a pattern. So 
So as far as their um, traits on the anterior teeth, they have a big cingulum and they have no depressions or mammalons on the front of them. So primary teeth, although they look like they have mammalons, they are not technically mammalons. Primary teeth do not have mammalons or depressions. They're just a nice flat tooth. And their roots don't bend distally like permanent teeth. Their roots bend toward the toward labially or toward the front. I'm not going to have like extracted teeth that you have to try to identify or anything like that. The main thing we want to know on the um, primary teeth to be able to distinguish them from a permanent tooth so that when you're looking in a child's mouth with mixed dentition, you know what you're looking at. And it takes time to learn that, so don't get frustrated if you get in clinic the first time you have a child and all of a sudden you can't tell. It just takes time. Crowns taper narrower toward the occlusal with a narrow occlusal table. And this is kind of what I showed you about the cervical bulge. See how much slope they have? This is the um, this is the occlusal table right here. And see how much they slope compared to this is the buccal side and this is the lingual side. And they just have a lot of slope. They have small occlusal tables. And they are wider mesi wider mesiodistally versus occlusal gingivally. So they're a wider tooth than they are high. Um, they have less anatomy, fewer grooves. That, that's kind of one of the reasons we don't place sealants usually on primary teeth. They don't have a lot of deep grooves. And so there's really no reason to seal them. He, they usually fall out before they get decayed unless the child has poor, a really poor diet. Um, they do have root and anatomy similar to a permanent teeth in that the maxillaries have three roots, the mandibular have two roots, and basically their roots sit farther apart. So a permanent tooth has two buccal roots and one lingual and they sit like this. A primary has two buccal and one lingual, but they sit more like this. So they sit wider apart. And they sit wider apart because they have to allow space for the permanent tooth to slide in underneath them. So they are longer. Um, all of your anterior teeth are longer incisal cervically than mesiodistally. Um, except the central incider is wider mesiodistally. So this is kind of a weird anomaly. I'm not going to ask you about this, but the central incider is, incisor is actually wider than it is tall. See how wide this tooth is? And it's kind of a shorter tooth where the lateral is tall and more narrow. It's not something I expect you to memorize, but it's kind of something you'll notice when you start looking in, in children's mouths. And they have smooth surfaces, no depressions, no mammalons. Um, we're not going to worry about their outline. The um, primary canine unique mesial contact of the maxillary canine crown is more cervical than the distal. I don't worry about the contacts on primary teeth, so you don't need to memorize the contacts on the primary teeth. One thing you will notice on primary teeth is as a child's head starts to grow, so they're, they go from two or three years old and they get this, you know, still little head and they get to be about five years old and their head is bigger, they're taller, they're bigger kids now. Their teeth, as their jaw grows, their teeth spread apart. So when you go to floss the teeth on a five or six year old, there's no context usually anymore. They have open contacts everywhere because their jaw is growing to make room for the permanent, bigger permanent teeth. They call that primate space. So they have these spaces and usually you'll see it between the starting between the canine and the first molar on the child. So there will be this extra space as they're starting to prepare to lose their teeth. 
So they have um, cusp ridges. So the mesial cusp ridges are longer than the distal. Only on other tooth is the permanent maxillary first premolar. Um, I'm not going to worry about cusp ridges. I just want you to look through these and see that they're shaped slightly differently, but most of the time the same. Molars, primary molars. Both types of maxillary molars have three roots. And then the mandibular have two. Maxillaries have the two buccal, mesial buccal, distal buccal, and a palatal, just like the permanent. Um, the mandibular, you have the mesial and the distal, just like on the permanent. Your premolars replace your, your primary molars. And you can see how wide these roots sit apart so that the premolar can drop down right in the center and resorb the roots completely on both sides. If the premolar does not drop right down in the center like that and it drops down toward one root, oftentimes what you'll happen have happened is a primary tooth that won't come out because the other root has not resorbed. The permanent tooth causes the roots to resorb so that the primary tooth can fall out. And if they're not placed properly, the teeth are not aligned properly, one of the roots won't resorb and the tooth won't come out when the child wiggles it. And so you've, those of you with dental experience have probably seen where your dentist has to go in and extract a primary tooth. Or maybe you've helped extract a primary tooth. But that would be why. Um, all have prominent buccal and lingual bulges. So that's one thing when you're looking in a child's mouth and you can't tell if it's a permanent premolar or a primary molar. One of the things to start looking for is the permanent, I mean the primary molar has really bulgy sides to it. The buccal and lingual are really rounded. Remember the shapes of your premolars. I always try to go the opposite direction. I think about what my premolars look like and I try to apply that to the tooth I'm looking at. If I'm looking at a mandibular tooth and I can't tell if it's a primary molar or a mandibular first premolar, the first thing I do is I look for that big buccal cusp and the little lingual cusp. If I don't see that, then I look for something else. I look to see, do they have big bulgy sides? If it has big bulgy sides on the, at the cervical, it's gonna be a primary tooth. If it doesn't fit the description of a premolar and it has the big rounded sides and a little occlusal table, it's gonna be a permanent molar, I mean a primary molar. And you just have to kind of keep looking at them to be able to tell them apart. So here are some primary second molars that resemble the permanent first molars. So if you look at these teeth that are in the blue circle, they have five cusps, both of them. They look very much the same. So if I looked in this child's mouth and I saw that, the first thing I would do is I would say to myself, is that a permanent second premolar? Or is that a primary second molar? Does it look like a permanent second premolar? Think about what you know about permanent second premolars. What do we know about permanent second premolars? Let's answer that question. Somebody answer the question. What do we know about permanent second premolars? Mand mandibular. I know you guys know this. We had quizzes on this already. Somebody jump in and answer. There can only be three to four cusps. Is that right? On a mandibular premolar, second premolar, it's different than the other premolars because how many cusps can it have? I can't remember if it's four or five now. Now that's a molar. That's a molar. OK, so three. So a permanent or a mandibular second premolar can have two cusps or three cusps. 
Okay. Remember, it will have mm -hmm. one buckle in either one lingual or two lingual cusps. That's where it gets the Y shape. So if you look at that tooth and it's got five cusps, we know it's not a premolar. Does that make sense to everybody? If not, please say something now. Can you repeat that? OK, so I'm um, going back to the, the slide. If you look at that picture and you're trying to identify the teeth in the blue, they look very much the same. So I'm trying to understand if when I'm doing my restorative charting, is that a primary tooth or is that a permanent tooth? Now, I know the back one is a permanent first molar. But I'm trying to understand if this is a primary tooth or is that a pre permanent premolar? Because I'm doing my restorative charting. So I go to my first line of reasoning is what is a permanent mandibular second premolar look like? And I say, well, it has one buccal cusp and either one or two lingual cusps. And I look at this tooth right here and I go, well, that doesn't just have one buccal and either one or two lingual cusps, that has five cusps, right? So I know that's got to be a primary molar because it does not look anything like what I know a mandibular second premolar should look like. So if you look at that tooth, does that look like a second premolar? I mean, yeah, mandibular second premolar? from what we know they look like, not at all. No. The other things then you can use, you know how I said usually look for more than one um, proof. The next thing to look at is the age of the child. Now I don't have the age of the child on here, but you would look at the age of the child. If the child's only eight years old, and we know that our primary second molars don't come out until they're about 11 or 12, it's likely that that's not a permanent tooth. And the one in front of it has not come out yet. And that would be where your first premolar sits. And since that's not a permanent tooth yet, it's not likely that that one is. So you'd kind of reason through it. Always look at the child's age though. Um, I was working with a student um, last term and the child was almost nine years old. And I said, did you, you didn't do your restorative charting when I came to do the data check? And I said, did, do you need help with the teeth? And she said, oh, no, no, they don't have any permanent teeth. They're all primary. And I looked at her and I said, this child's almost nine years old. Are you sure about that? And she goes, um, I'm guessing by the way you're saying that, that I, I'm wrong. And I said, let's sit down and look at it. And, you know, I'm like, just reasoning through it, if a child's almost nine years old, they should have lost their incisors by then. And so, you know, put all your pieces together. You have to be kind of like a detective when you're doing that. So um, crowns sim are similar to the maxillary. So the primary maxillary second molar has a similar crown to the max maxillary first molar, but smaller. They can have a cusp of carabelli on them too, so that you can't even use that as an identifying feature. But one thing you can remember is that if you look at um, a maxillary, primary maxillary molar, number one, they're going to have three roots. Your premolars don't have three roots, right? So if you're looking at a radiograph, that's going to be your dead giveaway. Um, your second clue would be um, you only have two cusps and bo both of your maxillary premolars only have two cusps. If you look at the occlusal of, of a tooth that's sitting up there and it's got more than two cusps, it's not a premolar. The, the maxillary ones are really pretty easy to figure out because your primary molars are going to have more than two cusps. Your, your permanent premolars are not. They're only going to have two cusps on the maxillary. Is that everybody tracking this? I have a question. Sure. So our PowerPoint's a little bit different, and it says that the mesial buccal cusp is almost equal to the mesial lingual cusp on a maxillary primary molar. So aren't, isn't it different for permanent? Isn't it larger? Yes. OK. Yes. OK, thank you.
how many slides do you have? We have 49 on ours, but our pages are different. Like my slides, my 37 is your 33. Okay, I just took some of them out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you have this one in there? Primary mandibular, second molar. I have the wording, our pictures are just different. Okay, I'll uh, replace yours with this one when we get done. So this is, this picture right here, is what I was showing you in that other picture. So your primary mandibular second molar resembles your permanent first molar. It's got, usually got five cusps. This makes it easy to be able to tell if it's a primary molar or a permanent premolar. Because this is a permanent tooth, your premolars are gonna come in right here. This is your canine, and these are your pre primary molars. So this is gonna be replaced with premolars. So we know that our permanent second premolar doesn't look like this. It doesn't have five cusps. So right away, we know this is a primary molar. And if you look at this tooth right here, and you look at the occlusal of this tooth, remember your permanent mandibular first premolar has that big buccal cusp and a little lingual cusp. That's not at all what this tooth looks like. And so just looking at knowing that, you're going to know that's not, that's not a premolar, that's a primary molar. So when we are um, taking a quiz or doing activities, unlike the molars where I have you try to identify the first from the seconds, I don't do that with the primaries. With the primaries, what we're trying to tell the difference between is, is it a primary molar or is it a premolar? Because that's what, in real life, that's what you're going to be dealing with on a regular basis when you see children. And when you like are working in general dentistry in the summertime and you have nine or 10 kids on your schedule in eight hours, you, you want to be able to flow through this pretty quickly and pretty easily so that you aren't hung up on trying to figure out what their dentition looks like. Um, this is a primary first molar crown. So if you look at the crown, you're sitting over the child looking down. This is what the primary first uh, molar looks like. And this is what the premolar that's going to replace it looks like. And you can see they look fairly different. One thing you'll also notice is that the primary molar is wider here than the permanent premolar is. This is where you pick up some of your space in your arch to allow for those bigger teeth as the head continues to grow. So you've got, or I should say the jaw continues to grow. So you've got wider here, this tooth is gonna fall out and this more narrow tooth is gonna replace it. And that's gonna allow a little more space for the canine, which is gonna come in pretty soon. That's a lot bigger than the primary canine. So you get a little extra space here. This is what your mandibular second molar looks like. And this is what your mandibular second premolar can look like. And so you can see they look different. So the pulps are relatively large compared to the rest of the tooth. And this we saw, um, this is a permanent tooth and we talked about this earlier. See how big the pulp chamber is in this tooth? So if a child gets decay in the enamel, it'll go through the dentin and reach the pulp a lot faster than it will on a permanent tooth. Here's a, a mixed dentition. Does anybody wanna guess at how old you think this child is or kind of a range of how old this child is? I would say like eight, maybe nine. So let's look at what we've got as far as teeth. So these, so right here we've got your permanent incisors and here's your primary incisors are still in. Down here, here's your primary incisors, here's your permanent incisors. And then up here, you've got your maxillary first molar and your mandibular first molar. They are not yet erupted. 
So what would we think the child is as far as age? Maybe like five. Maybe more like about five, yeah. How about this one? So let's start with orientation. These are the premolar or the primary molars. These are the premolars. This is a perm your first permanent molar. This is a first permanent molar. These are primary teeth and these are your permanent premolars. So how old would we say this child might be? Six or seven maybe. Yep, yeah, maybe about seven because it, this tooth still has little ways to go before it falls out at the age of eight or nine. But yet they've got this six year tooth already here, so probably about seven. How about this one? So it looks like we've got our permanent incisors in, top and bottom, and we've got our first molars in, top and bottom. We haven't lost any premolars yet, or gotten any premolars, lost any primary molars. We haven't lost any canines yet, so how old would you think this child might be? Maybe about six, seven, maybe a little bit older, maybe eight, because they've already got their maxillary lateral incisors in. So we're doing um, exactly what you're going to do in clinic when you are seeing children, only we're get, you're going to be doing it the exact opposite way. You're going to have the age of the child. You're going to know how old the child is, but now you're going to have to picture what should their mouth look like. So if you seated a child and they were seven and a half years old, this is about what you should expect to see. So if you seat an eight year old or a nine year old in your chair and you're looking at their teeth, remember some of those permanent incisors can be pretty small still because they're just a small tooth. So what looks unusual about this mouth? Anybody seen anything like this? the primary tooth retained? Yes, that's a retained primary tooth. This is a kind of common thing. This is a, um, this would be where your mandibular second premolar should be. It's um, usually a congenital thing. It runs in families, but a patient will not have a per permanent second premolar. And so you'll see this, the, because there's no permanent tooth resorbing the roots, and making it fall out, it stays there. Hopefully it stays there forever, but that isn't always the case. Lots of times this tooth will eventually become loose and fall out and the patient will have to get an implant. And what do you think is unusual about this mouth? Uh, it looks like the lateral is still a baby tooth. You're close. Look at the other lateral. Look at the canine. They're missing a lateral. They're, a miss they're missing a lateral incisor. So this is actually a permanent lateral, but this is the canine. This should be back further and there should be a lateral in here. Lateral incis maxillary lateral incisors are the other tooth that's most commonly missing congenitally. And so teeth will come in like this. Now we do a much better job. We used to just let this happen. Now we do a much better job. Um, we know that the lateral is missing when the child's a lot younger. And so they will actually put like a flipper partial or something in here to hold this space open. So the rest of the teeth come in where they should instead of coming in where they shouldn't. And how old do you think this child is? So we've got our permanent incisors here. 
Um, we have not lost any premolars. I would or, say eight or nine. I would say you're probably right. This child's probably about eight or nine years old. They've got their permanent molar for molars in. They haven't lost any of their primary molars yet, but they're close. You can see how <clears> they're <throat> getting real close here. So probably about eight or nine. So this is a nice little chart with the eruption um, of your permanent teeth on it. This, I think um, in every cohort, somebody usually will get a chart like this that's in color. They'll pull it off the internet somewhere and like laminate it. And sometimes students take them with them at the end and sometimes they leave them. So you may see these around clinic here and there. Um, I think when COVID happened and we disinfected the clinic, we um, took them all out but some of them may have reappeared, but it's a good thing to have just to make a little like postcard size um, picture of the eruption. And that will help you when you have a child in the chair to be able to just pull that out of your clinic stuff and look at it. Um, some usually um, the, they'll put that picture on one side and the flip side will have the primary teeth eruptions because you're going to have children that are three or four come in, sometimes even younger. Sometimes we get two-year-olds come, coming in, and so you want to be able to look in their mouth and see. And when you have a two-year-old in your chair, I'm just going to give you a warning, they are not going to open for very long usually. So your look is going to be very quick. So you want to be able to like kind of brush up on it really quickly and know what you're looking at, because they're going to open for all of about three seconds at a time. Does anybody have any questions? So when you're going through and you're studying, again, know the eruption patterns and eruption timeline on the primary teeth. Know the exfoliation pattern and timeline on the primary teeth, which should then subsequently tell you when the permanent teeth are erupting. I don't. The only thing you really need to know about the roots is that they sit farther apart and the reason they sit farther apart is so that the permanent tooth can drop down and cause it to exfoliate. On the um, single rooted teeth like your incisors, your permanent tooth is going to start at the root tip and it's going to work its way up and it's going to resorb the root as it is coming in and then eventually there won't be any root left and that tooth becomes wiggly and it falls out and the permanent tooth moves in its place. We, you are going to want to be able to identify the difference between your primary molars and your permanent premolars. So just keep looking at pictures of the occlusal surfaces. Remember what you know about premolars. If you don't remember what you should know about premolars, brush up on the premolars first and say, OK, if I'm looking at this tooth and it's it's sitting in the maxilla and I don't know if it's a premolar or if it's a primary molar, look at the cusps. Look at the shape of the tooth. Same thing with the mandibular. The mandibulars are a lot easier to identify. The maxillaries are a little bit more confusing but the mandibulars are pretty pretty easy to identify because the primary molars look nothing like the premolars. So work on that. I think I have an activity posted or something posted on that, and if I don't, I will definitely get one on there. For the quiz, will you be telling us like ages of patients or no? I, it's going to be one way or the other, like either I'll tell you the age of the patient or I'll have a picture, but you'll, and I'll ask you to tell me the age of the patient. Okay, thank you. But it'll be an obvious picture, like you'll be able to tell for sure. Okay, so let's look at the, um, oh, not the trigeminal nerve, go away. Um, let's look at the, periodontal 
anatomy. Like I said, this mostly should be a review for you since you've talked about this in 101 and we talked about it some earlier on already. So in the periodontal anatomy, um, you know you have alveolar bone. This is what your alveolar bone looks like. You have your root surface. Your root surface is covered with cementum. Underneath the cementum is dentin, and inside that is the pulp chamber. You have you fibers. Can see the PowerPoint. What's that? Oh, you can't see it? No. Uh huh. Let's go back. There we go. How about now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So let's start that over. So you've got alveolar bone. This is what your bone looks like. And then you've got your root of your tooth. You'll notice your root of your tooth does not sit directly into your alveolar bone. It has these little fibers around it. These are called periodontal ligament fibers. And they are what holds the tooth into the bone. They act as a shock absorber, so they stretch just like right like like elastic almost. When you chew and you have occlusal force coming down on your tooth like that, the tooth actually bounces a little bit within the housing here. And the ligament, that's what the ligaments do is they give it that ability to bounce so you don't have the hard cementum bouncing against the bone. Otherwise you'd wear out one or the other, either the bone or the tooth. So this little space right here gives it a little cushion. And those are just elastic -y fibers. You can see them on a radiograph. I'm sure by now you've looked at them on radiographs, right? Okay, so you can see them on a radiograph. There's a little space around the tooth. These fibers all have a name, and when we get in perio, we're going to memorize the fibers names. We're not going to memorize the fibers names now. And then you've got your um, gingiva so you've got your gingival margin up at the top that's the area where it the gum and the tooth meet inside of that gingival margin be, you've got your sulcus that's the area where you're sticking your probe you're probing in the sulcus the so it then attaches at the base of the sulcus with your junctional epithelium Um, we have zones of gingiva, so we talked about that's what healthy gingiva looks like. It's stippled, it's pink, it's firm. You have interdental papilla that are nice and flat. You've all seen this, you've looked in each other's mouths, you all have very healthy gums. You have your frenum attachments. I'm sure you've looked at these before. Your frenum attachments are supposed to be attached in a certain place in your mouth. If they are not, they cause problems. Some of you may have heard of something called a phrenectomy or may have had a phrenectomy where they actually go in and they cut the frenum because it's not in the right place. This is what pigmented gingiva looks like. It's um, darker in color. It's it can be spotty, it can be very dark, it can just have patches of dark. There's a wide variation in what pigmented gingiva can look like, but it is still healthy gingiva. And then these are the zones, and we've talked about these. You have your gingival margin, and then you have a groove right here, which is called your free gingival groove. It separates your free gingiva which is the part where you're sticking your probe. And then you've got your attached gingiva. Free gingiva, think of it exactly what the name says. It's free. It's not tied down. It just hangs out there freely. You're attached, not free. It's tied down. It's attached to the underlying bone. So it's that hard part. You're not probing in that. It's the part you see stippling on usually or should. And then you've got your oral mucosa or alveolar mucosa up here. 
and you've got this little junction right here called your mucogingival junction. It's exactly named after its location. It's the junction between the mucosa and the gingiva, mucogingival. It's this little line right here. And if you pull out your lip, you can actually see it. This is your sulcus is the space between your tooth and that free gingiva. That's where you probe, you probe in the sulcus. We talked a little bit about an, what we call an operculum. An operculum is a flap of tissue that hangs over a partially erupted tooth. Usually it's a third molar. So you've got a wisdom tooth that's trying to come in and it is, doesn't have enough space, but it broke through the skin. And so now you've got this flap of tissue. It's not always a third molar. You can see an operculum on a second molar or a first molar in a child. Usually what will happen on that though is as the tooth fully erupts, that tissue will flatten out and form just like a normal smooth ridge. On third molars, they don't always fully erupt. Sometimes they're stuck and they stay there and that's why the operculum never goes away. The gingiva support protect and protect the teeth. They are aesthetics and they help with phonetics or in other words, they help you speak. Imagine if you looked like this. Air would blow between those teeth and people whistle a little bit when they talk, when they have this. This is a severe, very severe perio patient. You're going to see these people in clinic. You'll see them in private practice too, but. Question? Yeah. How painful is that for those patients, like when they eat? Well, it just depends. Usually what happens is these roots will desensitize themselves. And so oftentimes it's not painful at all. It's more, um, it's very, um, has an aesthetic issue going on, but you're going to see patients that they're just happy that they have their natural teeth and they're not wearing a denture. So you, um, we'll talk more in perio about this and in clinic, but You'll always have to, and those of you who have dental experience probably know this. First thing you want to do when you're talking to a patient is find out what's important to them. Where do they sit with things? You might look at this patient and think like, oh my gosh. And they're like, oh, thank heavens, I still have my teeth. So you have like two, you could have two different attitudes about it. And your approach has to kind of be geared toward what their expectation or desire is, not yours. So if they're happy with this and they're comfortable and they can eat and they can speak and it looks healthy and it is healthy, um, that's good enough. It doesn't matter maybe to them that this doesn't look good. And Perio, we used to see quite a few patients like this. Patients cry when you tell them they have to lose teeth and they're very upset. So there's a lot of patients that will look at this and be just happy they have teeth. So periodontal ligaments, alveolar bone, and cementum, they work together to hold the teeth in place. And you can see on this radiograph, here's your alveolar bone, and then you've got your cementum on your tooth, and you can see this little dark line right here around the root of the tooth. See those little dark lines? That's your periodontal ligament space. So when you're looking at it on a radiograph, we call it a periodontal ligament space because we're not actually seeing the ligaments because ligaments are soft tissue and they don't show up on a radiograph. But the space where the ligaments are, you will see on a radiograph. Does that make sense? Diseases, you can get gingivitis, you can get periodontitis and you can get gingival recession. We'll learn so much more about diseases next term. This is what gingivitis looks like. Gingivitis, um, you can get bleeding on probing, inflammation, shiny tissue. I think in, in 101, you've probably already learned like some of the terms you can use to describe gingivitis or inflammation. You can see this patient has calculus on their teeth. 
This is um, a patient with gingivitis with pigmented gingiva. There's calculus. So this is kind of a fun thing to see. And it's an experience of fun that you will only share with each other. If you try to share that fun with family and friends, they think you're nuts. But taking a Cavitron and breaking that off is so much fun. But that's calculus. And you can see the tissue looks red right there along the margin, inflamed, shiny. These are some pictures of bones levels and bone loss. As you can see, this person has good alveolar bone. You can see the crest, alveolar crest looks intact. The bone levels look good. If you look at this patient, this one's a hot mess. Here's a picture of gingival recession. This patient has gingival recession with calculus on it. This patient has, well, it's actually goes beyond gingival recession, it's a mucogingival defect, but we won't talk about that until next term. This is crowded teeth. Here's some more um, gingival issues. This patient has recession because they have what we call prominent roots. You can see every one of those roots. They have big, thick roots. And so when you have big, thick roots like that, you tend to have thinner bone and thinner tissue. So you're more prone to recession. This patient has a lot of thicker bone. Did you guys learn the term for some of this excess dosis yet? I don't think no. so. So excess dosis, you, do you know what tori is? Yes. Okay. So excess dosis is basically like tori on the other side. So instead of having the big ridges of bone on the lingual side, it's on the buccal side. So if you look at this bone, it looks a lot like tori. It's just it's on the buccal. It's hard when you're first learning to distinguish the difference between prominent roots and, and excess dosis. Excess dosis is not as common as tori though. So when you're doing periodontal your stuff, you're going to do um, probing depths, you're going to measure for recession, you're going to come up with clinical attachment levels, you're going to measure bleeding on probing, frication involvement, tooth mobility, and then these this other one, this lack of attached gingiva, you probably haven't learned how to do that yet. Um, you probably won't for a couple more terms. And then your plaque score. You painted on, I saw you guys painting disclosing solution the other day. So you're doing plaque scores, right? So um, if you aren't doing plaque scores yet, you painted on disclosing solution and that's how you do a plaque score. But um, these are all the things you're going to do when you're doing your data, right? You're measuring all these different things. This is just the pictures of some charting. Measuring mobility, you'll learn how to do this. Basically, when you measure mobility, you don't use your fingers because your fingers are soft. And so you, you can be walking back and forth and all that's happening is the tooth is pushing into your tissue rather than actually measuring movement. You measure mobility with the ends of two instruments that are not soft. But we'll learn how to do that in clinic. Um, just know that you're gonna measure mobility, you measure probing depths, um, these are some pictures of probing. You all know how to probe now. More pictures of probing. There are several different kinds of probes out there. I'm sure Professor Ramos went over some different ones besides the one you have in your kits, or you have two in your kits, I guess. So you might get in an office and have different kinds of probes and have to like relearn how to measure. Gingival recession, you're going to measure from the gingival margin to the CEJ. Probably done that in clinic. We'll learn how to do clinical attachment levels next term. This is furcation. These are furcations where the roots separate. This is a furcation probe. It's, this one is a, called a neighbor's probe. 
We have special probes. We have these in clinic for measuring furcations. Again, we'll learn how to do that next term. This is an abscess. And that's how you use a frication pro, but we can, we'll show you that as we kind of go along. We don't actually have like a competency or anything on it. We just sort of show you it as we go. Not all offices will have these. I worked in Perio, so we always had them, but not all offices will. There's just some pictures of how frications can be in different locations. See how much higher up this frication is. This root trunk is really long. This root trunk is short. This one is really short. That makes a difference by how much bone the patient can lose to periodontitis. If they only lose two millimeters of bone on this tooth, you're still going to be OK. On this tooth, you're not. Two millimeters of bone is going to probably take you right to the furcation. So how the, the roots split and how long your root trunk is makes a big difference. And we'll see that as we go into clinic too, and perio. So this is what frication looks like on a radiograph. This is normal, it's filled in with bone. This one, this dark circle means you've lost bone. Again, we're, we're gonna learn how to measure attached gingiva, but know that you should have a certain amount of attached gingiva that helps keep the teeth in place. There's a picture of disclosing solution. So you can see the darker areas are where you have plaque. The lighter areas are just normal disclosing solution. So you can see this patient has some marginal stuff going on there. That's a picture of your dentrix charting. You all know how to do that now. Restorations, restorations can be a problem for many different things. These are what we call overhangs. You can see that they're not flush with the teeth. Has Professor Bowles shown you like overhang restorations and stuff on radiographs yet? No, okay, well she probably will. Um, these are just root grooves. So you can see this is a lateral incisor and there's that root groove that comes up by the cingulum. Um, there's different types of periodontal therapies. Root planing is the one that you really care about. There are all different other types. We're going to learn those in perio. That's why most of this chapter, either you've already learned or you're not going to learn till next term. Um, so I just kind of go through it quickly. Those first few slides of the gingiva is about all you really need to know. The rest of this we're going to learn a lot more as we go. We're going to learn subgingival calculus, this is what it looks like on a tooth surface or a root surface, I guess. So you notice right here on this picture how the CEJ and the calculus is right there. That's why sometimes it's hard to tell if it's calculus or the CEJ. So if you're going and you're scaling right here, the calculus is right at the CEJ. So it's a little hard to tell. So if you took your Explorer though, and you start here and you feel the CEJ, you can kind of follow it along and then you know that that's calculus. That takes a little more experience and training as you're in clinic more to learn that. Don't expect to know that right now. Uh, let's see, just another picture of how difficult it can be to access a frication for instrumentation. Imagine getting your scaler in there to scale underneath that. These are just some pictures of how roots can vary on teeth. So if you had a tooth like this where the roots flare out and then they come back in, imagine trying to get into that frication. This is why we don't want frication exposure. We want them to stay good and healthy. Inner dental brush. This is a picture of an implant. We have a whole chapter next term on dental implants. We will learn everything you need to know about implants. And these are some implant supported restorations. You can see these are crowns and that have implants underneath them. 
is there some implant problems? We're going to learn all about this next term as well in perio. And that's the end of this chapter. So this was just kind of a overview. Basically, you know all the stuff you need to know for this chapter already that you've learned in 101. So just maybe review those first few slides about the tissues, but the rest of it you probably should pretty much know. Do you have any questions on this chapter? Anything in 101 that I